Hi, Dr. Siwes. Thank you so much for joining me today. Um, I'm sure most people already know you, but for those that don't, maybe if you can just kind of introduce yourself um, in your background. Great. Yeah, uh, it's really great to be with you again. By the way, congratulations on that book. It was excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I love that. But uh, yeah, my background is that I'm a medical doctor. I'm actually a surgeon. Um, I'm both a pediatric surgeon and an adult surgeon. And my primary interest over the last years, much to my own kind of against my better judgment has been to do more and more of the metabolic health. But from an ethical perspective, I just can't ignore that in the surgeries that I do, particularly when it comes to metabolic surgery. So I've become more and more involved with understanding and managing the biology of insulin resistance and nutrition, and in particular, juxtaposing that to the conventional thinking. And using my clinical experience, my, my interactions with my patients to understand trends where perhaps we haven't had data before. And that, I think, is what we'll talk about today. Right. But I'm clinically active in the state of Florida. I do consults all over the world. Uh, today, I was in Saudi Arabia. I was in Caracas, Venezuela. I was in Paris. Uh, it, it's just beautiful how the world has opened up. So, um, But that's my background. Um, the only other piece about me is that I personally have lost about 98 to 100 pounds um, I still fight that fight pretty valiantly. That was 22 years ago. And so there's a personal angle to this. And then finally, I have done my time in the laboratory doing some of the basic science, the basic research into the way that carbohydrates interact with the blood vascular space and some of the issues that are uh, fundamental to understanding vascular injury and diabetes. So that's my background, but I really am primarily a clinically active uh, researcher and practitioner, and I see a lot of patients every day. Yes, and that is one of the biggest reasons I wanted to invite you um, on my channel, on my podcast, because there aren't too many people publicly that work with clients day in and day out, or patients that see blood work and then trends to see if things are really working. And um, I heard you on I think it was Meet RX podcast where you and Dr. Baker talked about like trends that you've seen in blood work. And so I definitely want to dive into that. But, you know, one thing that caught my kind of ears um, where I just basically perked up is I've been doing a lot of research on liver imbalances, you know, bile, uh, biliary imbalances. And I know that you have a PhD with kind of liver health. And so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about that. For example, biliary cirrhosis, bile acid malabsorption, even cholestasis, it's all in a sense, just an imbalance of uh, bile, maybe bile blockage. And so I just am starting to kind of go down this rabbit hole of, so what does this mean for a carnivore? You know, can we be over, and maybe this is where it's going to bleed into the uh, blood work, but are we sometimes overdoing fat soluble vitamins, maybe even the B vitamins, because like B12 and I think folate and maybe even sometimes B6 can slightly get stored in the liver. And so if we're inundating the liver with a lot of excess nutrients, where we sometimes see hypervitaminosis A, can that actually affect our health? And so because you're, you know, you're an expert with the liver, I just wanted to kind of pick your brain about that. Absolutely. And I appreciate that. And I think you're absolutely correct is that a number of people who are able to sustainably do tough things, at least initially, like strict carnivore, that kind of thing, have what I call nth degree personalities. In other words, they'll do something to the nth degree. Yeah. And sometimes more of a good thing is not necessarily a better thing. And that's really what we're talking about. And also with the exposure, especially under the COVID lockdowns and things of, uh, probably too broad and too ignorant a population on the internet where <clears throat> too many people are wannabes giving advice who have no basic knowledge, but they're smart salespeople and they're trying to push a product. So they come up with a tiny little quirk that's kind of irrelevant. And then they blow it up into this whole big expose. And at the bottom line of all of that, they're trying to sell a product. And I have huge issues with that because First of all, fundamentally, the human body is incredibly resilient. It is really, really good at taking care of itself. Otherwise, we wouldn't exist as a species. So what we really have to do is to get out of the way of the body doing what it does best. And um, so that's the first thing. Just to take one thing off the table, because you mentioned a number of things where there are certain discrepancies. You talked about certain diseases that are congenital or genetic 
abnormalities of bile production, bile release. These are enzymes that don't work properly, right. certain channels that don't work properly. Um, so there are a variety of non-nutritional diseases of the biliary system and of the um, liver that I want to take off the table. I think okay. they're outside of the spectrum of this discussion. Certainly, we can make those diseases worse by eating inappropriately, but I don't want to discuss those. And I want to make sure that we draw a specific line around what we as human beings can improve in ourselves versus what we can't improve in ourselves. Okay. And we leave what we can't improve into ourselves to gastroenterologists, to hepatologists to help us with that. Biliary cirrhosis, some of those diseases are important to understand. <clears throat> Let's step back and we'll talk about the biliary system first. And the biliary system does two things. It, number one is a waste disposal system. So it's a way to get um, lipid soluble waste in, back into the intestinal tract. But the biliary system is also connected to the lipoprotein cholesterol system as part of fat, mo fat absorption and fat mobilization. So one of the discrepancies with the human body is a number, fat and a number of things that are fat soluble, that are lipophilic, that like fat, um, are inherently important to the human body. But the human body primarily is water-based. It's an aqueous body. So we've got this discrepancy between fat and water. And therefore, we have to have two systems, one to transport and manage fat, and the other one to transport and manage water. And obviously, the, the two, they interface, but they don't mix. And the biliary cholesterol lipid system is there to, man, to manage fat. And then we've got the aqueous system, which manages sugar. And one of the interesting things is, in our bloodstream, we have two things. We've got fat that we use for energy, and we've got sugar that we use for energy. One is hydrophilic, the other one is hydrophobic. So it's an interesting discrepancy, and it's important to understand that as we look at this. So the biliary system is there to handle fatty waste. So if you do overdo some of the vitamins and the fat-soluble vitamins, they'll get dumped out. The bile system is very good at getting rid of certain toxins um, and certain uh, byproducts that get used up that are waste from metabolic processes. When we're continuously turning over our cells, we call it autophagy, but that's basically waste product. Some of it gets reused like a junkyard, but some of it has to be disposed of and it gets disposed of in the bile. The other key thing about the bile, so <clears throat> when it comes to cholesterol, cholesterol is essential to have in the intestine for the reabsorption of lipids, right. but it's also a waste place for excess cholesterol. And one of the key principles that governs how much cholesterol the liver makes, some of it has to go to waste, some of it gets used by the body, is insulin. So if you take biology in a healthy insulin sensitive person, when we eat a meal, insulin levels go up, whether it's protein or whether it's sugar, whether it's fat, insulin levels rise a little bit and insulin switches on the cholesterol production pathway in the liver. It's called the HMG-CoA reductase pathway. Insulin and thyroid hormone manage that pathway. So it switches that on during meals when insulin level is, levels are up and it switches off the parallel pathway, which is the ketone pathway. So you're either producing ketones or cholesterol. And insulin regulates that. Okay. So during a meal and shortly after that, you're producing cholesterol under the influence of insulin. But then what should happen is <clears throat> very rapidly after the meal gets absorbed and stored, your insulin level should go down. And if you're eating once a day or twice a day, you get this insulin spike and then the insulin goes down and you switch off the cholesterol production pathway and you switch on the ketone pathway. And that's why healthy people are in ketosis between meals. So we're using some of the fat that we've stored. And that ketogenic pathway is governed by glucagon, which is the hormone that releases sugar and releases ketones, produces them and releases them from the liver to the cells. So we have this negative feedback cycling between insulin and glucagon that is normal. Now, just as a caveat to that, cholesterol is important for the production of VLDL, one of the lipoproteins. It's the one that the liver makes. And during and after a meal, it puts the fat, the triglycerides that the liver makes, and it puts the cholesterol into that, and they get shipped out to the fat cells for storage. Right. That's why that insulin process is down. And then between meals, when your insulin level is low, you produce, the liver produces a molecule called HDL. 
And HDL has the job of going out and um, uh, uh, um, picking up itinerant cholesterol, bring it back to the liver, and also reformatting what, what LDL looks like. Be that as it may, we want that diurnal cycling between VLDL, HDL, and also cholesterol is the precursor for all steroid hormones. Estrogen, testosterone, progesterone, cortisol, all of the steroid hormones start out as cholesterol and that's regulated by insulin. So you see how all of this integrates. Now, if you are on the standard American diet, if you're eating a lot of carbohydrates, if you're insulin resistant, then your insulin levels never come down. Right. So you switch on this cholesterol production pathway continuously. And even if you're fasting, even if you're not eating, your insulin levels are high, you're insulin resistant, and you're continuously producing cholesterol, you're not producing estrogen, at least um, uh, ketones. And the problem with that excess cholesterol is that has to go somewhere. So some of it goes into circulation, but some of it goes out into bile. And the bile goes through the liver into the bile ducts, and most of that is concentrated in the gallbladder. Because what bile does is bile is the way the human body absorbs fat and fat-soluble vitamins. Fat is the only product that doesn't go from the intestine straight to the liver. Fat goes from the uh, intestine via something called the thoracic duct, and here in the left neck, it dumps into the big vessels of the body and gets distributed directly to the fat cells. And <clears throat> what bile does in part is it produces this little, actually, it's a very large molecule. It's called a micelle. It's like a soap bubble. And into that soap bubble, um, you can put the fat, you can put the, or the, the intestine puts the fat, puts the broken down fat, the triglycerides, the phospholipids, and also the fat soluble vitamins, vitamins A, D, E, K are the four fat-soluble vitamins, they then get absorbed into the lymphatic system, go to the bile duct, and go to the, go to the neck and get distributed straight to the fat cells. And from the fat cells in a molecule called LDL, back to the liver where the ADEK, vitamin K is an important liver um, uh, uh, vitamin, where they get used in the liver, but they also get distributed to the bones, to other places. So that's that cycling. So the bile has to be concentrated in the bile duct so that when you eat a fatty meal, let's say you eat your ribeye steak, the gallbladder squeezes and produces enough bile to massively absorb that fat. However, when you overproduce bile, uh, when, sorry, when you overproduce cholesterol because you're insulin, insulin resistant, now all that cholesterol, massive amounts of cholesterol gets into the, into the gallbladder and it sits there and it forms crystals cholesterol crystallizes and it forms crystals and those crystals form little stones. And we call those little stones, gallstones, cholesterol gallstones. And they settle into the liver. If they go down, the tiny stones go down the duct, they can block the duct and cause acute cholecystitis, or they can cause inflammation of the gallbladder. Now that doesn't happen instantly. It happens over years and years and years, decades of standard American diet eating. So by the time a patient comes to me as a surgeon with diseased gallbladder or they've got pancreatitis from gallstones or inflammation, they've had years of their gallbladder not working, but they didn't even know. And this is important because of the noise on the internet, the BS noise on the internet. So that gallbladder hasn't been functioning for a decade before someone realizes, oops, I've got to get a surgeon involved and get it out. So it's irrelevant. At the same time, during all that time while I've been eating fat and other things, the bile is still running down out of the liver into the bile ducts. Otherwise, they would turn yellow. They'd get jaundiced. Yes. You get jaundiced when the bile duct is blocked and the bile spills over into the bloodstream and it settles in your skin. And you get very itchy because those are the crystals that occur in the skin. So <clears throat> for people that have got gallstone disease, now they've had their gallbladder out and everybody tells them, don't eat fat. That's absolute garbage. It's absolute nonsense. Your, your liver is still producing a lot of bile. If it wasn't, you'd be dead. And so therefore, you can still eat the same amount of fat. You can still eat exactly the same. You don't have to take a whole bunch of things like ursodeoxycholic acid, which is a medication. You don't have to take ox bile. Or all. That, is in the, that is an imaginary concept in the eyes of people trying to sell you a pill. Your body is absolutely fine. Now, if you drink a gallon of olive oil, of course, you're going to have the runs, you're going to have diarrhea, but that's true for anybody, gallbladder or not. And 
So remember, all because you just had your gallbladder taken out, it doesn't mean you suddenly have to stop eating fat or you have to take all these magical pills the doctors are selling you. You may get diarrhea a little bit easier. You may have a little bit of an issue with overload of fat, but that is never an issue. And this enterohepatic cycling, enterohepatic means from liver to gut, that's how we, how we move bile and fat around in the body. At the same time, the reason your poop is brown is from bile acids and bile salts. Right. So you know, as long as your poop is brown, you got bile going out. Whoops, my coffee went over, um, out into the garbage. When your poop turns white, like chalky, then you've got an obstruction of your bile duct. And that's a concern. And we see that from time to time. So as long as your poop is brown or dark green, don't sweat it. Don't worry about it because we know that biliary system is working fine and eat all the fat you can. So carnivores should not worry about the fact that their gallbladder is no longer there. Yeah. And I agree with that. I mean, even if your gallbladder is not there, I mean, essentially it's the storage system where your liver will still produce the bile. Um, but a few thoughts that came in while you were talking about that whole process, and that was really good, a really good explanation. Um, one is that there are some carnivores that still still struggle with loose stools um, six months into the diet. They've tried the ox bile. They've tried you know, other digestive enzymes. And it, it becomes perplexing of why are you still having loose stools? You should have been assimilated to the excess fat. And maybe it's some of this, um, the b- bile malabsorption. Um, there are studies where it says maybe 50% of people that have Crohn's or IBS may actually have excess bile in their colon. So that's one, that's um, one of my questions. And then the other thing is if you, so let's say you've had a lot of the insulin resistant issues with the bile and then the liver or the gallbladder, and let's say you haven't removed the gallbladder because, okay, so now you're eating a carnivorous diet and you're healing but maybe your liver and your bile aren't working perfectly. So, and then if you're also consuming a lot of, you know, foods with a lot of vitamin A or a lot of fat soluble vitamins or the excess of B vitamins, you know, whether it's in supplements or excess liver or whatever it is, maybe it can be a tax on some people. And I, 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 I hear what you're saying. And that is exactly the concern that I have. Too many okay. people make assumptive associations that are completely ma- fabricated and completely false. Okay. Okay. So a large part of what you just talked about is based on assumptions. The way to know, and and we do this all the time with people with cystic fibrosis uh, and in certain short gut patients, there is a very simple study you can order and it's called fecal fat analysis. Mm. And basically it sounds disgusting, but you poop into a jar for, for 24 hours and they can actually measure the amount of fat you have in your stool. And until your fecal fat is positive, you are just making assumptions that your gut isn't working properly. Does, does that make sense? Yes. And, yeah. and um, fat malabsorption is extremely rare in most okay. people. There are degrees to it. I don't know if you remember the weight loss medication called Orlistat or Ally. It was a fat blocking, uh, um, it, basically when people thought that, that we became fat because we ate fat, right. it blocked fat absorption. And the warning on the label, the side effect was uh, beware of fecal seepage because it basically blocked the absorption of fat. You pooped all the fat out and you basically lived in diarrhea land. So okay. the first thing, if you're really worried about this uh, uh, six, to eight hour, uh, six to eight months out, get a fecal fat study. That's the first thing. The second thing is it may not be an absorption problem. It may be an enzymatic breakdown product. Remember, carnivores are pretty much 100% dependent on enzymes to break our food down. That's why humans have the longest small intestine of any mammal, okay? Because we are enzymatically programmed. We are not fermenters or digesters of our food. When we talk about digestion, it's enzymatic digestion, not bacterial digestion. So um, under those conditions, you may have issues with your pancreas where you're not producing the lipases, the, the enzymes that break the fat down adequately or break the protein down adequately. And of course, if you're eating tons of fat, no matter how much, uh, how normal your system is, you may be overwhelming that system. So those may be causes. Uh, the other thing is anybody that's had surgery or has inflammatory dysfunction of their small intestine in particular. And you mentioned the Crohn's, uh, 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 ulcerative colitis is exclusively a disease of the colon. Crohn's disease can affect your gut from the mouth to the butt. 
and it's an inflammatory condition of the intestine. But you, there is, there may be bacterial overgrowth, there may be uh, candidiasis, there may be biome issues as well. But the Crohn's is the classic autoimmune disease based on uh, an abnormal human biome. And in fact, uh, so if you've got short gut from Crohn's or you've got a processing issue, either not enough enzyme or too short a gut or not enough bile, of course, as soon as the fat gets into your colon, it's coming out the bottom end. So with those Crohn's patients, in fact, in my practice, where I see a number of Crohn's patients, we actually manage them on purpose with a higher protein pure carnivore diet. And there's a group in Australia, I can't remember the guy's name, but he's the same, same group that described H. pylori for acid. You can Google this, um, who've done a number of experiments, uh, sterilizing their Crohn patients gut with antibiotics, and then putting them on a pure carnivore diet and basically getting Crohn's to go into remission. So the inflammatory bowel diseases um, are bacterial and autoimmune related in large part, at least that's our understanding. And the carnivore diet over time changes that biome to be more uh, um, uh, carnivore-based or animal product-based rather than vegetable-based because the bacteria that ferment food are different than the bacteria that esterify fat. Remember one other thing. Once in, the, in humans, once food gets into the colon, it's game over. The colon can only do two things. The colon absorbs and secretes water, salt and water. Those are the only two things that cross the colon. So once you, your food has left the small intestine, it gets into the colon. It's liquid on the right side, the beginning. Um, if it's fat, that fat gets esterified. It gets broken down. If it's vegetables, it gets fermented in the colon. And that's what makes our poop. So if you've got a short colon, or if it goes through the colon very quickly, you may have diarrhea. But that's not necessarily a bile problem. Okay. It may be a, an intestinal a rate of movement through the intestine, and that can also be studied. So bile issues are a tiny fraction of the entirety. And I think it is important if anybody has that as a problem to see somebody who is not, to see a physician who's not a knee-jerk anti-carnivore, anti-fat doctor, but let's figure out what the devil is going on by specifically analyzing uh, rate of movement, uh, pancreatic enzymes, uh, bile conditions, and also seeing if it truly is fecal fat or something else that's causing the problem. And you're right. I mean, I always get the GI map and there's, I think the stea, uh, I'm not even sure if I'm pronouncing it, but you know, yeah. that's normally the market of seeing how much fat is in the stool. So it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Stearic um, acid is what you're talking about, but uh, you know, the best thing is just to look at global fecal fat. And then, uh, so you want to treat the problem you don't want to knee jerk to somebody on the internet that's going to tell you that this ox bile is really good for you. If right. you've got an enzymatic problem, there are pancreatic enzymes similar to what we use for ulcerative colitis for, for uh, um, uh, cystic fibrosis patients because their pancreas doesn't work properly. Um, if it is a bile issue, there's things we can do with that. Uh, there are ways we can change uh, that to improve somebody. Sometimes it's a histamine problem. In my own personal case, um, if I eat salmon, I know I have to stay at home. So I've got the choice. Either I eat the salmon and suffer the consequences, which I've chosen to do, or I cannot eat the salmon. Or Jane, my, my nutritionist in my office, uh, has introduced me to some of the antihistamine type products that work well. I'm just not comfortable taking them. The whole histamine thing, isn't that also related to the gut? So, I mean, some of it will be produced in your, um, I guess, <clears throat> other organs. But in general, most of the... Um, the enzymes that break down histamines are in your small intestine. And so wouldn't the thought be that if you work on um, making the small intestine work better, the, there, you should have less histamine responses. But what I am noticing also is that carnivores seem to all of a sudden have more histamine reactions. Any thoughts on that? Right. You're absolutely correct. Now, again, that's a misused name, the word histamine. What you're talking about is intestinal inflammation. And whether that is antibody inflammation, antigen antibody, whether it's cellular inflammation, whether it's damage to the intestinal lining, it, the word histamine has become this catch-all phrase, yes. like using the word Hoover for a vacuum cleaner uh, or Kleenex for a tissue. Mm -hmm. It is a very specific, narrow, focused word when used in science, but it's, it covers now in the lay, and that's the concern with the internet, is 
everybody is talking about this histamine reaction. They have no idea what it means. They just heard it f- from, you know, uh, uh, Bob the uh, blogger on, on, I'm Bob the blogger, by the way, Robert Sivers. Uh, but, but the point is that there are specific inflammatory reactions that get triggered by certain antigens. The classic one is celiac disease, which is gluten and gliadin, which affects every human being some at a subclinical rate, some at a clinical rate. And that's why one of the first things we do is to remove grains. There are, when you call histamine reactions, there are reactions, really what it's about is is your intestinal uh, immune system going nuclear against a little bug. It's an overreaction by the intestine to a small trigger. And one of the cool things about insulin sensitivity, which you get from being mostly carnivore, is all of those inflammatory markers in the intestine, in the blood system, in the interstitial system, and intracellular markers, and we test for all of those, they all go down. So instead of the soldiers being on the street ready to go and shoot somebody, the soldiers are hanging out in their barracks. They're ready to go, but they're just chilling out and having a beer and waiting for some action. So understanding the, the way the inflammatory system works in the gut is important. There's antigen-antibody interactions, then there's cellular immunity. And part of what you want to know about your gut is how ramped up is it or how quiescent is it. And what a carnivore diet does is it just says, boys, chill out. Boys and girls, chill out. Go back to your barracks. And they calm down that inflammatory system. But the guys are ready to go. So when I eat salmon, there's something in salmon that irritates my gut and I have an overreaction and it's only to salmon and everybody's going to have their little quirks and you've got the choice then. But I think to use, I was incorrect in using the word histamine for something that I don't quite I can't pinpoint exactly what it is, but I know what it is. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, when I looked into, because there was a period where all my clients would come to me and say, I have a histamine response. I'm having, you know, and then I started researching it and, you know, there are some, um, some, some research shows that histamine receptors are in certain parts of the body. And then other ones that, uh, the science shows that it's everything, right? Like any allergic response from food or, um, anything is a histamine response. And so you need to take antihistamine. So, I completely understand where you're coming from. Um, but I do see that in general, uh, people tend to say, well, I've been meat based for a while and now I added a plant or I added a different type of meat that I was once intolerant to. And now I'm showing sensitivities. And I think when you are saying that these um, people are, you know, the, your immune system is kind of ready to respond. That makes a lot of sense to me. Um, especially if you eliminate something and then if your body is running really well, it'll show like, Hey, I'm not a fan of you eating that. And I've had a similar reaction to salmon. Once I started getting really itchy when I had no issues to salmon before. And we see that commonly. It depends on, on where those, re- and sometimes they are immune reactions. Sometimes they're enzyme reactions. I'll give you a classic uh, example, I've, I have a number of patients who for a while say, oh, somebody on the internet told them dairy was really bad. So now they're off dairy. Dairy does this to me and dairy does that to me. And uh, the fact that they, so they exist because of dairy, they don't quite comprehend because all children can't survive without dairy. Right. Um, having said which, let's say they go off dairy for a year or six months, or you have a really bad gastroenteritis. Uh, the lactase, the enzyme that breaks down milk products, and, and it's not just lactase, there, there are proteins in milk as well as uh, um, the lactase, but the lactase, lactose intolerance, which everybody quotes erroneously, that enzyme lives in the very tip of the villi of the uh, intestine. Mm-hmm. And if you don't drink milk, why do you have to have the lactase enzyme? So your body removes those. And then if you have a glass of milk, you've got no way to break that down. So the milk creates this awful reaction but it doesn't mean you're necessarily lactose intolerant. And even if you're lactose intolerant, lactose is actually a form of sugar, Mm -hmm. but it's the the most common intolerances to milk are not to milk, to the, to the, to the sugar, it's to the proteins in milk. And that's why a beverage company called Coca-Cola that you might've heard of are now making these protein free, uh, this A and a B protein. And they're removing one of those proteins from their milk, which is less allergenic, but, 
Uh, those are all ways in which people come to erroneous uh, uh, conclusions and then swear adamantly that this is the problem without having any proof. And, and that's my concern with nutrition because we've got the vegans going ballistic about it. We've got the carnivores going ballistic. We've got everybody going crazy with assumptions. And they may be correct. They may not be correct. But at least before you open your mouth, figure out what the truth is. Or if you're going to speak, say, I really don't have evidence to this but here's what my thoughts are. And, yeah. you know, we're going to talk about something in, in that regard. It's an observation that I've made. And I'm now slowly with my colleagues trying to explore what that, um, what that evidence truly is. But any other questions along those regards? Any other thoughts along the lines that we were talking about? Yeah, well, I mean, I think it'll continue into like nitrogen, uric acid, because I know one thing you said is that you noticed that the um, BUN number goes up over time with like your insulin, um, you know, people that are insulin sensitive. And in general, I see a lot of the um, clients I work with, their markers over time, also their BUN is higher. Now, if their creatinine is normal, I don't worry about it as much. And then I look at the other things like, is their LDL going up? But I wonder, like the reason why I brought up all of this liver imbalance or bile imbalance is, I wonder if sometimes it's the food that we're eating as carnivores, right? So if you think about just from a, and obviously we don't know their whole story, but the veteran carnivores that have been doing it for 10 plus years, a lot of them didn't eat nose to tail. They didn't eat a ton of liver. They didn't eat a ton of kidneys. And so they were eating mostly muscle meat. They weren't worrying about all the nutrients in chronometer and they're faring well. Now there's this new space where a lot of people are like, you need to eat liver every day. Um, it, I don't consider carnivore, you know, carnivore without liver and things like that. But, you know, the fact that we store, vitamin A, D, E, and K in our liver, and then some of the B vitamins we just mentioned. And if we have any fatty liver from our prior diet or insulin resistance, I do think there is a risk of overdoing the vitamin A, soluble vitamins for the liver, which then can maybe impair our liver, not function as well. And then maybe it affects our kidneys indirectly. And, and, and so I'm wondering, um, and we can talk about ammonia, nitrogen, and all that, but I wonder if it's some of the diet of these carnivores. So yeah, that was yeah. kind of- So I, I think the first uh, axiom of healthcare, at least as physicians, do no harm. Yes. And one of the things that we've got to make sure about, I'm myself a mostly carnivore. I'm about 95 to 98% carnivore. You just saw my baby who's uh, about the same and he's nine, 10 months old. So it's something that I inherently understand to be one of the healthiest ways a human being can eat. But at the same time, I don't want to blindly get locked into this. So I don't want your audience to understand that I'm anti-carnivore. I'm very pro-carnivore. And as such, I want to make sure that we are healthy and that other people can't point fingers to us. And I think what I said earlier on is the nth degree thing. One of the, one of the key things about uh, once you've been carnivore for a while, and once you're becoming insulin sensitive fat adapter, I'll talk about that in a second, you shouldn't need any supplements. I if you, and, and I think that's one of the beautiful things about carnivore. It should be supplement free. But when people spend a long time on the internet, they're getting thrown. I mean, I get patients coming in with two pages of supplements and additives. And it's totally unnecessary. I mean, how, how the hell they can be fat because they're so busy eating all these pills. I don't know where there's room for the food, let alone. So unless you've got a specific deficit, Number one, it is unnecessary to supplement once you're in a steady state. Number two is um, if you're unsure about where your numbers are, they can all be tested for, but they should be tested for somebody by somebody who understands the difference between an insulin sensitive and an insulin resistant person. I'll give you a perfect example. And based on my experience, I've been doing this for 22 years. I read on average anywhere from 10 to 20 full blood panels every single day. Wow. Okay. So, uh, you know, I've got uh, literally about 30,000 patients on my books and they, they all tell a story. So one of the stories that I've, I've, I've seen with my, and I'm not talking specifically exclusively about my cohort of authoritarian carnivores who've been doing this for a very long time. And there's a spectrum of the carnivore diet, as you said, there's the nose to tail people, there's the ribeye people, there's the fish people, there's the egg people, there's the non-dairy, there's the dairy, there's the I don't eat liver, I eat a lot of liver. So within the carnivore sector, there's all of those. But the first thing that, that 
uh, I want people to know it. We get a lot of people coming in now who have low thyroid hormones. Their, T, right. their T3 is low. But you see, you can't look at one number. So you've got to look at TSH, you've got to look at T3, you've got to look free, free uh, T3, free T4. You've got to look at the whole spectrum. And in fact, one of the things that I've seen, if you're insulin sensitive with low insulin C-peptide, it is normal to have a low T3. So when people come in and their doctor says, oh, your T3 is low, you must go on, on some medication. You, those people, even though they're now in the upper part of the normal range, are overdosed on thyroid because the beauty about being carnivore is instead of your hormones doing this, they're kind of more like a vibration. And our, the ideal hormonal milieu in the human body is a gentle vibration that fluctuates. The difference, the way I describe it to my patients, but where do you live? In Austin, Texas. Okay, so you're close to the sea, but not on the sea. Mm-hmm. I live, I mean, the sea is out my back door over here. So if you walk on the beach, mm-hmm. you see these waves crashing onto the beach. That is the hormonal background of someone on the standard American diet. If you get in your boat on a calm day and you go two miles offshore, the waves are doing this, very calm, and that is an insulin-sensitive carnivore. And you can't treat someone who lives by crashing uh, waves on the ocean the right. same way. You've got to make that distinction. Does it make sense? Yeah, no, so, I totally right. agree with that. Um, oh, my... So that's the first part. But Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. No, no, I was just going to tell you anecdotally. I mean, so my, one, my clients, a lot of the um, clients that are carnivore long-term, their T3 starts lowering and then yes, they start getting the concerns. But I personally, um, ever since going carnivore over three years ago, my T3 is low, TSH is normal, T4 is normal. That's the, are the other TSA, if your TS, TSH and T3, T4 are negative feedback systems. Yes. So if your TSH is high and your T3 is low, we've got to figure out why. You right. may have Hashimoto's, you may have iodine deficiency. Yes. Uh, there's, great, there's so many different options and we've got to test for those. Yeah. But if your TSH is normal, and your T3 is low and your T4 is normal, you don't have an issue, you're just carnivore. That is a good place to be. Does it make sense? Yeah, so no, I agree. The other, the other simple thing is, and I've got, and I've literally got, I've got blood work here. This is over 100 patients that I've collected in the last month okay. uh, that I've seen that are all uh, extended carnivores or, or carnivore veterans. I love that word. And all of these people, if you showed their insulin blood work, they've all had insulin C peptides checked. If I showed that to every, uh, I'll just give you a read here. Let's just pull up one over here. Um, C peptide 0.72, A1C 4.7. And well, forget about the A1C, insulin 2.6, C peptide um, 0.72. And, and the difference between type one and a carnivore veteran is this, the type ones can't make insulin the carnivore veterans don't need to make a lot of insulin. Does that make sense? Yeah. But if that carnivore veteran ate, let's say, a tub of ice cream, their insulin response would be great, but then it would come right down because they're insulin sensitive. But, and so we've got to understand those metrics because nobody in this country, no physician in this country ever sees that lower number without it being a disease state. But now it's normal. So the next thing we look at, and this is, I'm going to read you a quote because this is really getting to the nuts and bolts of this. This is a, a patient that, that texted me something. Been keto for years and about almost a year have been ketovore, then in the past four years became carnivore. The problem is, as this happens, my once normal blood glucose is now always 110 to 120. This is raising my A1C. Mm-hmm. I eat maybe once or twice a day at most, and it's usually steak or liver or ground beef or pork. Not sure where this is going, but it doesn't look good. And I agree completely with that person. I don't care. I don't care at all what your insulin and your C-peptide is if it's low. I don't care what your LDL is if it's high. What I look for is markers of inflammation, in particular vascular inflammation. And we know categorically that A1C, elevated blood sugar, apart from nicotine, are the commonest causes of intravascular inflammation. We know that higher blood levels do that. So <clears throat> we look at those markers and the question is, why is that happening? And all got very, very similar blood work. And they all look the same. They are all low normal BMIs. Mm-hmm. And when you look at them, they have no fat to give. They are all very skinny. They look really, really good. Um, 
for those of you that, that, well, I guess I'm not going to quote names on the internet, but these are not the Sean Bakers. Okay. These are the lean, skinny carnivores. Okay. Um, and the problem is they have no nutritional reserve. And if they're eating once or twice a day, and they're not eating a massive quantity, they're not doing the Sean Baker three to five pounds of, of beef a day. And I love Sean. Um, yeah. But the point is that they're under eating and they have no supply. They're basically the Olsen twins of the carnivore era. And the problem then is that where do they get energy from between meals? Um, and there's two issues. The first one is they're eating once or twice a day or still fasting. They're having to break down their own bodies yes. for fuel, particularly to produce sugar. Because the other problem that I have with this group and the other similarity in this group they're all fastidiously heavy fat eaters. They eat fat with everything. They're eating butter. They're eating MCT oil. They're adding lard. They're eating the ribeye steaks. They're, they're eating masses of amounts of fat. And their protein fat ratio is off, at least nutritionally. Mm -hmm. So the problem with that is that, as I said earlier on, the human body is not either in ketosis or in glucosis. It is always in both. Mm -hmm. Right. You have to use protein. You have to use sugar. The yeah. rate at which you move the, uh, uh, use the two is different. But if you eat a big fat load for dinner and you don't eat for another 24 hours and you have no fat to give, your body is actually going to flip over to the having to manufacture sugar because it can't manufacture uh, um, uh, fat. So it gets that sugar from protein. So now you're breaking down your own cells. Yeah. And <clears throat> when you look at fat and carbohydrates, they consist of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, which the body can metabolize to water. Whereas when you look at protein amino acids, it's carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. And the human body is not very good at dealing with nitrogen. There are three molecules, there are three uh, ways in which we eliminate nitrogen. The first one is to turn it to ammonia and process it into something called ure urea. Or B, when you measure BUN, blood urea nitrogen, that is soluble nitrogen. Ammonia, ammonic, uh, uh, ammonium has become uh, urea in the, uric, uh, in the uh, urea cycle, and you can pee that out because it's a liquid waste. Creatinine is the other way in which we get rid of nitrogen. So creatinine is something we measure. We measure BUN and creatinine as a function of liver of kidney failure, but BUN and creatinine are eliminated in the kidney. They tell us about renal health, but they also tell us about nitrogen metabolism. And ideally, I want your, your BUN to be 18 to 20 or lower. Mm -hmm. And your creatinine ideally should be 0.7 or lower. Now we're starting to see these same patients come in with BUNs of 22, 28, 32. So somebody today that was at 38. Creatinins, we start to see creeping up. We start to see the 0.9s, the 1.2s. I The same person had a 1.44 okay. with ridiculously low insulin. That's telling me that their, their kidney function is starting to fail. So they're starting to get into kidney trouble. And the third way in which we get rid of nitrogen is in uric acid. Now, uric acid is the common way in which reptiles and birds get rid of nitrogen as solid poop. So if you smell a bird's poop, that guano smell, that's the uric acid. But uric acid in the human body, we can only tolerate a very, very small amount of uric acid. Uric acid, like, gold, like uh, cholesterol, crystallizes. And it crystallizes in two places. It crystallizes in joints, and we call that gout. Right. And it crystallizes in the kidneys, and that can cause kidney stones. But when we're trying to get rid of the breakdown products of cells, um, protein, uh, nitrogen from protein, but also the purines and the pyrimidines, which are derivative, those are the cellular DNA, the RNA, those are derivatives of uh, DNA and RNA, or the purines and pyrimidines from red blood cells. That's where your uric acid comes from. And if you've got this massive autophagy and this turnover, you're now getting much, much higher uric acids. That same person had a uric acid of 9.9. .9. And my upper limit of normal, what I like to see, I definitely want to see it above 5.5. I typically want to see it below 5.0. And so the blood sugar starts going up, the A1C starts going up, which is just 
means that the blood sugar is continuously up. You don't have these high spikes of 180, 160, 190, whatever it is, but they're going up to the 110, 115 range. And on average, I mean, my blood sugar, I've got a CGM on here. My blood sugar average is 65 to 75, maybe 85 in the early morning. That's kind of my normal range. And I'm mostly carnivore. So once it gets 20 or 30 points higher than that, that's a concern. So it's causing vascular inflammation. Now we're seeing this protein uh, looping around in the body because here's what's happening. What's happening is your um, cells need fat and they need sugar. They need both, mostly fat. But the problem is you're not eating any sugar and you're going long periods of time without eating protein. So your liver is saying, dudes, I need a source for sugar. Well, where do I get it from? You're not eating any sugar. The glycerol in the fat and triglycerides is not enough. So it breaks down your own muscles. And there's this protein pool, this turnover pool that comes from your muscles, that comes from your enzymes, comes from your hormones, hormones. And vitamin D is a hormone, by the way. It's not a, yeah. um, a protein, it's a fat-soluble hormone. So we're using up our protein pool to manufacture sugar. Because remember, you can store fat in your fat cells. You can store sugar as glycogen in your liver and your muscles, but there is zero place to store amino acids. Yes. You have to transform them to sugar and then to fat. So now if you've got the cycle of taking protein, turning it into sugar, but your body isn't necessarily using that sugar, your blood sugar goes up, your insulin's not responding to that, and then the sugar gets circulated back to your liver and the liver turns it into triglycerides and your triglyceride count is going up. Does it make sense? Yeah, it totally does. Your HDL count is still high. And the concern for me, uh, the question I then ask is, is that dangerous? And the reason why I say it has to be dangerous is because of the inflammatory markers. Their ferritin's going up. Their C I, the CRP often sometimes does. I very rarely test CRP because it's such an acute phase thing. Mm -hmm. You can sneeze twice and it goes up. But your ferritin's going up. Your white cell count is going up. Your neutrophil count is going up. And then your lipids, which I also consider to be an inflammatory marker, they're all going up. Your A1C, which is a marker of vascular inflammation, all those numbers are going up. And that is concerning for me. A few things. So one of the liver imbalances, um, I think it was biliary cirrhosis, for example, that can affect like your ability to uh, um, excrete your bilirubin. Um, and then also then uh, in, in effect, it, you will also not be able to remove your cholesterol. So then could it be again, maybe some liver imbalances that can then cause our LDL to go up and not necessarily just this ammonia, the uric. Right. So the first thing I want to do is I want to take biliary cirrhosis off the table. Okay. That is a primary biliary cirrhosis. We don't know what causes it, but it doesn't occur. It, there's no correlation. It's primary uh, because we really truly don't know what, it, what causes it. And I've looked into this. It okay. is not primarily related to our diet, to what we're doing metabolically, mm -hmm. unless I've missed something. I've looked at it pretty carefully. There are other forms of biliary cirrhosis that are congenital. And okay. a lot of those patients end up with liver transplantation. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not, I, I would like to diminish the dietary contribution to that. But you're absolutely right. It is very common for me to see my carnival patients who have B12 levels in the greater than 2000 level. I mean, I'm just looking at this, uh, yeah. the blood work I have in front oh. of me. B12s are through the roof. And I always test B12. But the paradox is often their vitamin D levels are low, which is interesting. Okay. And that's got to do with the cholesterol cycling well, uh, and, the, and the insulin. Yeah. Liver, for example. So beef liver, chicken liver, all the animal livers are really, you know, so all the fat soluble vitamins are supposed to kind of balance one another out. Well, they all have really high amounts of vitamin A. Now you can counter vitamin A with, I guess, some of the vitamin D, but if you are taking so much of the vitamin A, there's like minimal vitamin D in liver, but there's also a lot of vitamin B12. There's also a lot of folate. All of those get um, stored in the liver when there's excess. So I wonder some carnivores say that they can go outside and they get, they're able to tolerate the sun more. Maybe they're able to get more vitamin D, but is it because they have so much vitamin A excess? And it's just, I mean, I don't know ways to prove this. Well, that's, that's no, the way to prove it is to measure those levels. And you're absolutely correct. But okay. The paradox is that we see um, the different molecules, there's four or five different types of vitamin K. We typically check K1 yeah. and K2, right. but uh, K is K levels, uh, A levels and, and um, um, the A, the E and the K, which are the three fat soluble vitamins are not uncommonly massively elevated. And the D is low. 
because D, vitamin D is not a vitamin. It's a cholesterol hormone. It's a steroid yes. hormone. Yes. And it gets produced in the skin. And then it has to be converted in the liver and then the kidneys into the active form of D. And right. the sunlight, the ultraviolet light activates it in the skin. So it's a different subset. But I am concerned in a carnival person because high insulin levels block vitamin D. But So why are we seeing low vitamin D levels in carnivores when the insulin is low? And I don't have the answer to that. A lot of these folks are out in the sun. They're running all the time. They're out there all the time. I saw a woman today whose cholesterol level is over a thousand, which is ridiculously high. Total cholesterol is over a thousand. Her LDL is over 800. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, But now her triglycerides are creeping up and she's skinny, 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 pure carnivore, exercise like crazy, but she is a massive fat consumer. So what we've done with her is to diminish uh, the fact that she's consuming. You know, one of the guys that I absolutely respect tremendously, who's kind of migrated to this, although he's old as the hills, which is a good problem, is Richard Bernstein. Okay. And Dr. Bernstein is a type 1 diabetic who really used a ketogenic diet on himself because he was getting misinformation about type 1 diabetes. And, and his principle is very, I believe, very important. The fat that matters is the fat that comes with your food. And pouring globs of extra fat on, and he's a type 1 diabetic who lives in ketosis. He says that is counter to my insulin. And he knows because he knows what he's injecting. And he says when we're using massive amounts of insulin, that is a concern in terms of managing our blood sugar. Does it make sense? So <clears throat> what, they, what we're doing with those folks is – diminishing their fat consumption and increasing their protein consumption, not per meal, not, not in the one meal that they're eating, but with those skinny people, they can eat two or three meals a day and distribute that protein consumption through multiple meals a day. And then you don't suffer autophagy. So those are the patients that say, look, whatever you do, don't fast and get to a point where you're eating two or three times a day. So you've got continuous incoming. You're not going to mess with your hormonal milieu, but you are going to get more frequent insulin glucagon cycling. You switch those systems more commonly. And that's what we're looking for. So yeah. those patients, their, their nitrogen metabolism and their uh, blood glucoses get a lot better. The few that I've done that with now, I don't have the full answer to this, but when we increase protein and we increase protein fat ratio and we increase um, the frequency by which they eat, smaller amounts more often. That's where we should see the shift back to normal. And the paradox also is, and I think you're correct, these people that are eating tons of liver all the time, tons of organs, that may be okay, but we're seeing hypervitaminoses with those folks. And B12 is the common one, yes. A, E, and K are the other ones. And a lot of these folks, unfortunately, and I can't tell them not to do this, I tried to, but they won't, they're taking D and K2 as a mm-hmm. continuous, ridiculous amounts of supplement. And their K levels are through the roof. Now, their PT, PDT are normal. Their INR, which is really what you're using K for, is the clotting factors. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're all normal. We test all of those. But those are the concerns. And I think it, you're right that they're consuming too much, but they're also not using that much. So the other question you have to look at is, are they consuming? And this is where the... Where the I don't know, and I'm, I'm throwing this out as a, as a question. One of the reasons their blood sugar is going up is because not excessive overconsumption or overproduction, it's underutilization. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, so no. It's whether you're using those vitamins to the extent that you need to use them to process. If you're, if you're this fine vibration, if you're that two miles off the coast, and there's just this, you may not need this intense, what we call futile cycling that uses up huge amounts of NADP, NADPH, all of those things. And that may be why your vitamins are rising to an excessive level. Um, they're becoming toxic, not because of overconsumption, but underutilization, under need. And in fact, one of the things that, one of the common things that we look at, theoretically, carnivores, long-standing carnivores should be profoundly vitamin C deficient. Right. And the, and the reason they're not is because you just don't need that much vitamin C. The human body doesn't store vitamin C very well. Right. So uh, one of the reasons you probably don't, and I, I still, 
squeeze a little bit of lime, key lime. I've got a key lime tree outside. I still squeeze it into my drinks every day. Uh, that's just more a, but I can't tell you that that's the right thing to do because most of my uh, carnivores don't use C. Um, we know that theoretically the level should be low, but they're not. Right. And, and so I think that's under utilization rather than under provision. So I, I think that a large part of these vitamin excesses and certainly B12 is not just consumption, it's lack of utilization. And that can make a lot of sense. I mean, so after listening to your conversation, you know, I've been doing this whole um, hypervitaminosis, are we doing too much in the carnivore space? And that is affecting like people's thyroid and other um, just an excess of nutrients. And then I heard your thing on nitrogen and uric acid. And I noticed that a lot of my clients have higher buns to our BUNs. And so I just started kind of doing my own research. And so I just wanted to share a few of mine. Um, one thing, for example, was um, there are studies where they show that people that are um, that were injected with different stress hormones, so not only cortisol, but like adrenaline, epinephrine, they start releasing a lot of excess nitrogen or not excess, but release. So then they become like nitrogen um, negative. So one thing is, I wonder if certain carnivores or people that are doing keto, they're overly fasting, right? So then they're not eating. That's enough. the point. That's exactly it. That's yeah. autophagy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I know. I know. And so that's one. Um, the other thing was, um, you know, like obviously the oxalate one is one, but it's because some people want to reintroduce plants. So you don't think that's a big one. Okay. Um, the other one the, was yeah, the, mis- the, mis- oxalate, yeah, yeah. the problem with oxalates is production, not absorption. Okay. Okay. And, and there's been too much hype on the, on the, Oxalate overconsumption. Uh, it's oxalates on all the plants, and oh, you gotta I, no. I okay. Yeah, I used to eat. Um, this is what I tell my clients. Um, I used to eat one pound of spinach every day for twelve years of my plant-based life, and I never had the oxalate dumping. So I don't think everyone goes through it. I don't. Um, well, the other thing that I thought was interesting is just that um, when you are eating higher fat and you are also fasting, you're going to produce more ketones. And I think there are some studies that show that at least initially, and this may be- So let me back you up there, not necessarily. Oh, not necessarily. Okay. Not necessarily. Okay. Early on, yes. But, yes. but in, in um, your mature, your, what, do you, what did you call it? I love that word. The carnivore that. veterans. Yeah. I'm not the talking, veterans, you're right. I'm talking away. about the carnivore newbies that are still kind of insulin resistant. Yeah. That's where the ketones or the higher fat may compete with the uric acid dumping. So you're because right. Remember, if, ketones are just a fraction of okay. fat energy. The majority, 85, 90% of the fat that we use when we were in fat adapted ketosis are non esterified fatty acids. Okay. The heart, for example, uses 85% of the fuel in a standard American diet or a carnivore is non-esterified fatty acids. Yeah, right. Ketones are a tiny fraction okay. of the energy. Sorry, I just want to segue that. No, 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 that's, no, that's, that's, that's another fair. misnomer because everybody's using these MCT oils and all these, they're trying to bump up their butyr- the BHBs. The and, beta hydroxybutyrate. And the, thank you. Yes. And, yeah. and it's, it really is anti-biologic to do that. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, no. So, sorry, I, I interrupted I, you there, but that was another <laughs> little... No, I, I totally agree. I, I mean, just the fact that coconuts within their fat, the MCT is a smaller portion and of the MCTs, the C8 is the smallest portion, yet we are consuming only C8 as the fat. It doesn't make sense from us, you know, the way that a coconut is made. Um, so yeah, I totally- but The other interesting about fat, what are the only essential fats? Three omega and six omega fatty. And and what that means, and and this is what, again, a lot of people just don't understand. It's so obvious, but a lot of people don't think this way. If there are only two essential fats, and yet the human body needs a ton of structural fat and a ton of uh, uh, energy fat, it means that the human body can produce all the fat it needs. And the problem with the fats is that when we convert sugar to fat, we presume palmitic acid and lolaic acid. Whereas when we're eating fat, we've got more complex polyunsaturated, unsaturated, and saturated fat. It's all three. If you eat a steak, you're getting all three in. So it's a mis- as long as you're getting adequate three omega fatty acids in and some sixes, for the rest, the human body can interchange that. It really depends on the metabolic driving forces of what's driving those uh, uh, lipogenic pathways. Um, but, but all this, this focus on what type of fat is best to eat, and it really is a misnomer. Okay. And when you're eating meat, you're eating all three fats anyway. Yeah. So, and it's all interchangeable because the gut breaks it all down. So again, I mean, those are little places where we get into trouble. And I think 
um, a little, there's a beautiful paper here that I've got. It's actually in German, but okay. uh, translated, it talks about uh, um, the protein, the, the nitrogen balance. And I think that's really what we're talking about is that carnivores in positive nitrogen balance, where they put in more nitrogen in than they need, that's a positive place to be. When you start going into negative nitrogen balance, where your body is taking, where your, where your liver needs nitrogen from your body, that's where you get into trouble. And so for the carnivores, eating, increasing your protein consumption, especially when you are uh, um, in that, that veteran carnivore state, high uh, 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 fat adapted, low, in, low insulin, um, you want to keep your nitrogen positive, uh, balance positive. And, you know, guys, I, and I know that, that I want to separate the personality from the science, but um, Ted Naiman is actually onto something when he talks about his uh, uh, protein ratio. Uh, Andreas Infeldt, who's the head of um, the diet doctor from Sweden, uh, Andreas um, put out a very interesting tweet. It was this, after almost two decades on low carb, I apparently still have a lot to learn. In the last eight weeks, one change has resulted in 10 pound loss and over 10 inches down. And Andreas is tall as the Eiffel Tower, but he's this big. So okay. for him to lose 10 pounds, uh, that's a lot. Over 10 inches down weight circumference, lean mass up, and the lowest blood pressure and fasting insulin I ever had, guess what changed? The answer is a higher protein energy ratio. Uh, more protein, still low carb, but limited added fats. So a lot of my clients um, grew up in the low fat craze, right? So they, when I see them, they don't eat ribeyes even. They don't even eat like the fattier cuts. So the 65% fat or 70% fat in terms of total calories, they eat the leaner meats. Um, and they said they're essentially scared of fats. But these women also, because like you were talking about the stress hormone, the sex hormones are also produced from cholesterol. Um, they don't see improvements with their sleep, um, hot flashes, unless they start adding, a, and maybe it's more calories in general, but their proteins are sufficient. Maybe it's like the one gram of protein per one pound of ideal body weight, but the fat content is not enough. So they're maybe eating 60% fat or 55%. And so when I get them to eat about 70% fat, they start, they start healing um, more of the, and so and when they're just eating mostly protein, their blood sugars are high in the morning. Like no, there's, there's no question. There's no question that early on, I would put those patients or okay. those folks in the non-carnival veterans phase. So I what, would put them on the earlier part. Okay, and, fair enough. You know, and then so there's kind of this continuum where you go from the standard American diet where your biology is just awful and you're insulin resistant to slowly becoming insulin sensitive and then fat adapting. And that process takes anywhere to start takes six months to a year. Okay. So if you haven't been pure carnival for a year, you're not near that category yet. Okay. Once you get out uh, two, three years in, then you start to see the shift toward the nitrogen issue problem. Does that make sense? Yes. So okay. th there's an improvement and then a worsening. And those folks tend to be uh, um, their lipid profiles are going up on the LDLs, up on the total cholesterols, up on the triglycerides. And that becomes a concern for me. So okay. all of these, it's not just one number, it's all of the metrics. And that's where they go from being super healthy to being sicker. I agree with you that the, the hot flashes and that kind of thing, you may or may not see relief. I mean, it's a normal process for women to go through menopause and experience change. So uh, to what level, to what degree of change you see, that's different. I actually routinely measure DHEA, FSH, LH, testosterone, progesterone, right. and estradiol, which is the active form of estrogen, on every patient. And I've got all of the, I mean, I've got every one of these numbers uh, we've got over here. So I can look through my blood work and analyze all of that. And part of the problem with, this is where you want to talk female hormones somewhat sophisticatedly. Um, part of the issue is I see three profiles. And if you look at people on the standard American diet, you've got one group of women who develop polycystic ovarian syndrome. Right. They are hyperinsulinemic when they become insulin resistant. They can produce massive amounts of insulin. Their testosterones are through the roof, yeah. but their estrogens and their, and their progesterones are low. <clears throat> then we get the high estrogen, moderate progesterone, low testosterone women who are fat everywhere. They the, I hate to say this, but we're talking the classic female shape where there's fat everywhere and it's subcutaneous fat. The high testosterone women 
look a little bit more androgenic. They're a little more masculine. Right. They've got the big jowls. They've got the hair. They've got the, the more truncal fat. And then we've got the higher progesterone, moderate estrogen, low testosterone, and that's lipedema, where the fat collects from the waist down. Mm -hmm. And each of those three, three categories of women, and that's biologically predetermined, go through menopause differently. Okay. And, and that's so, that. yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, so it's, it's so, and I mean, those are the numbers that I get. And there's a woman in Germany who works with lipedema, who corroborate, I was in a talk on the lipedema society with her, and she corroborated our observations on those three female hormones. Mm -hmm. So I mean, all of that stuff, we work with a lot of infertile women with PCOS, who are in infertility clinics, trying to get rid of their PCOS. So we try to get that uh, testosterone lower. And that's where high fat carnivore is very, very useful. Right. Those women don't do very well with fat initially, but e upping their fat ratio brings that testosterone number down pretty quickly because it suppresses insulin. So all of those are, this is not just one little guy on the internet saying, oh, this is the problem. We really have to look at that. And I don't have all the answers. In fact, the one thing I can categorically tell you is there's far more that I don't know than I do know. Yeah. And, but these are observations of what we're seeing. And yeah. I'm just raising a bit of a red flag to the carnival veterans. Make sure you check your blood work. And more of the same thing is not necessarily a better thing. And we're studying these 100 plus patients now over time, because I've got the change over time to look at what changes we make. I, the one thing I know is there's a problem. The, the problem that I, I have that I don't know is how to fix it. Sure. So we're, I tell everyone, we're going to do an experiment with you. Let's see where you are in three or four months and see what's changed. And that's really what I'm looking to do. Does, does that make sense? Yes, it does. Um, and, and I'm in agreement. I mean, I always say um, that I wouldn't have clients if carnivore works so beautifully, right? I would not have anybody to work with. Um, and I, I have some shared clients with you, which is funny. But um, so the one thing that um, I also researched was that in order to have kind of nitrogen balance, it looks like one thing that I see just over and over is just the balance of stress, right? So if carnivores are over fasting under like, or what they call, they just are eating their one meal a day, or they're just, you know, eating whenever they're hungry, which they're probably never hungry because they don't have this sugar spikes and stuff. And so sometimes people are under eating that can kind of throw off your nitrogen balance. But I've also seen some research and I could send you the papers, but if your body starts really uh, utilizing the amino acids well and breaking down the nitro, um, the proteins well, and in a very um, effective way, it actually shows in the science that you may not need, you, you would think that someone like Sean Baker would need more protein, but it actually shows that over the years, as your body matures and is able to use the um, protein smartly that you actually need less. What you're saying makes sense to lower the uric acid is um, maybe you need to be in a less ketogenic uh, um, autophagy state. But then over time, you also see, I, I wonder if the just over consuming protein will work long term. Because if people are also like Sean Baker's over time, their blood sugar may go up because they're eating more protein than they actually need. Correct. And so, then <laughs> so there's a couple of, you know, Sean is linear. Sean eats the same, he works out the same, yes, and he's on true. a linear trajectory to be bigger and better. Another guy that you can look at is a guy like Robert Sykes, the, uh, the keto oh, yeah, savage. Yeah. And, and he's a bodybuilder, so he primes himself for competition. And throughout the year, he's fluctuating in terms of what he's doing. So he will build up muscle, and he's got a certain protein fat ratio for that. He also likes to build the strength and the thickness of his muscle when he's off competition. So his body fluctuates massively, and he's a very worthwhile guy to follow because he analyzes all of this. And then you've got a guy like Zach Bitter who goes out and runs two 30-mile 30, 30 um, ultra-distance marathons That's for training on a Saturday and a Sunday. Zach is this big, but he has to consume massive amounts of food. So there are people that we can look at, but here's really, and I, and I think for the audience, it could be lay audience, it could be more people, more sophisticated. What we're really talking about is the way the body works, and you know this, the gut breaks protein that we eat down, down into amino acids. And there are 21 amino acids, 20, maybe 21 amino acids that we use, and the body rebuilds those. So what we're talking about is protein transformation. And really what we're looking at is the uh, balance, or I hate the word balance, but the switch from protein synthesis, um, which is a fixed controlled system, 
to protein degradation, which is very, very volatile. So the human body can only make protein from amino acids at a fixed rate. Mm -hmm. And there are certain things that govern or that help the body to make protein. And then the breakdown occurs with cellular turnover. So that's kind of at a fixed rate, but it can be accelerated. In other words, what I said earlier on, you can't store protein. So when you eat all those amino acids, you have to get rid of them somehow. So what you're talking about with nitrogen balance is, are you consuming and building more protein? Is protein synthesis greater? That's called a, called a positive protein balance. Or is the breakdown of your own protein and the protein you're eating, that's a negative nitrogen balance. And you've got growth conditions and breakdown conditions. And under those conditions, the um, protein synthesis quota can only exceed the degradation pro uh, process if you're eating more. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. So let's look at what causes protein stimulation, protein growth, and protein degradation. The most important hormone that results, that triggers protein growth or protein building is growth hormone. Right. That's its job. So you've got to look at the pituitary gland. You've got to look at growth hormone levels. That stimulates protein synthesis by a product called somatomedins. And those are things that live locally in the muscle. Uh, thyroid hormone, T4 and T3, are controlled by TSH from the pituitary gland. Right. Same place you get growth hormone. And then insulin actually inhibits protein synthesis. Okay, so, and then the somatostatin inhibits growth hormone and TSH and insulin. So we've got all these hormones um, that are controlling protein synthesis and then cortisol directly inhibits protein synthesis. Right. So that's your stress hormone. Yeah. So if your stress hormones are up, you're blocking protein synthesis. And all of those things are important because cortisol triggers protein degradation. So if your stress hormone levels are up and the stress hormones, cortisol is a, is a steroid hormone, but the adrenalines, the noradrenalines are not steroid hormones. Right. So all of, we've got to understand the interaction of all of those. And that's why you have that surge of, of sugar in the morning, the dawn effect, which is not just the release of sugar, but it's also the conversion of excess protein to sugar in the morning. Right. Um, and, and you've got to look at growth hormone, insulin, somatomedins, all of those. And remember what I said earlier on is that your T3 and T4 in a carnivore are very low, right. which means it's going to affect protein synthesis. So exactly what you said is that a guy like Sean Baker, whose TSH and T3, at least his T3 and T4 may be on the lower side, or somebody who's, who's a protein veteran or a carnivore veteran, they may be low. So they're not able to produce protein that much. And if they're eating all this protein, it gets shoved to sugar, and that's where the problem comes in. But I'm seeing the problem not with those folks, but with the high fat eaters. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. But you're seeing it. So if the because it's then the question becomes, I mean, if you need to get sufficient calories to. Well, let's flip this around because you can't <laughs> just look at it at a caloric load. You've got to look at it distributionally. Okay. And um, if protein synthesis happens during and after a meal. Right under the influence of insulin, under the influence of growth hormone. And remember, when you're eating, you're not bouncing around and shoving your cortisol level through the roof. Right. So eating is kind of a relaxed state for the human body, yes. and it's pro-synthesis. So, but if you're only eating once a day, and what excess fat does, it also suppresses appetite. So these folks are going long periods of time during which they're having that protein degradation phase. And that's why it's based on that information that I ask these folks to, to break up their meals to multiple small meals a day. So they increase the level of synthesis and try to get into a positive nitrogen balance. I, it I really, not, it, sorry, it may not be a ratio problem. It may actually be a frequency problem. Yeah. And I, um, just from my own history of trying to do one meal a day and then my blood sugar going up and just feeling really tired after so much protein in one sitting, um, I switched to two meals on average, sometimes three, but in general, even if your gut is impaired, it's just ideal to eat multiple times today to just to have better chances of your small intestine absorbing. Um, if you have any bile imbalances, like you've never eaten a ton of fat before and all of a sudden you're eating ribeyes, um, maybe it's better to break it into three meals. So I'm in a complete agreement with you. I never thought about the actual protein synthesis as well, but it makes sense too, because 
a lot of my clients, when they do the one meal a day and they check their blood sugars and they never thought, oh, on a carnivore diet, my blood sugar would never be high. And they check. And then after just maybe two pounds of ribeye, their blood sugars are in the 160, 180s, which is extremely high for a carnivore. And that's when they realize, oh, maybe that's why I'm not sleeping through the night and such. So I'm in agreement with you with the multiple meals. Um, I just wonder, will that be enough to kind of do the protein synthesis, but then, and then just not have enough fat? Well, okay, so, so let's look at one other, and, and really the way my mind works is, okay, here's a problem. Mm-hmm. Let's figure out as tangentially as we can right. why this problem exists. Absolutely. And we've looked at protein fat ratio, and I'm going to come back to that in a second. We've looked at frequency of meals, this flux between insulin and glucagon, yes. which is very fine tuned. Um, and also the other hormones, the cortisol versus growth hormone versus TSH, because your thyroid hormone also fluctuates diurnally through the day. Yes. But let me ask you this. Um, all carnivores, all wild carnivores, mm-hmm. what do they eat? Meat. They eat wild animals. Right. Have you ever eaten deer meat? Me personally, no. How much fat is there? It's very in, lean. Very lean. Right. Okay. Now, what the, what the carnival, big carnival animals, the big cats, and I come from Africa, I've seen tons of this. Okay. Uh, what the big cats do is they start with a belly and they eat the organs first. So that, again, is an argument pro-organ. They start in the belly, but what else is in the belly is all the fat of the antelope is in the belly. That's They keep visceral fat. Um, so they go, for the, they go for the organs, they go for the fat, but that's also a way to stock up on their micronutrients. Then they eat the meat, and the meat has almost no fat. There are no antelope in Africa that are wild that have a huge amount of muscular fat right cows are are an anomaly when it comes to the way cows and sheep are an anomaly in terms of where they keep their fat does that make sense yes and one of the key things about cows and sheep is they don't have to be afraid and what i mean by that is all the antelope the the animals the mammals that other carnivores eat they have (laughs) are continuously afraid They're continuously skittish and running around and um, they don't sit on a couch and watch TV while they're eating grass like cows do. So therefore the fat finishing, even of grass fed uh, domesticated animals, that fat content is much, much higher. And the argument for cutting back on fat is to look at the lipid profile of my carnival veterans, but saying, okay, these folks are a little bit more like, let's say a lion. And maybe they should eat what the lion eats. I'm not going to banish them from eating the organs, but I'm going to say eat more lean protein and let's see what happens with that. So I'm in the experimental phase with that, but that's where my logic comes in. I don't know whether the science is going to prove this. We're going to figure it out. Right. And the beauty is we can track this. And then there's one other thing that I think is important to discuss in this kind of forum. Let me ask you before yeah. we move on is yeah. with the lean protein, when you say that, what, what would you say is lean protein, right? Because I mean, some people try to do just chicken breast for a while, like the, um, the protein sparing modified fast, and it's nearly impossible because you're always ravenous, right? Your body has to break down the amino acids. So I'm guessing you're not talking that lean, but you know, what I mean, chicken breast is one tuna, or the bigger, the game fish, the muscles of game fish is okay. another one. And then also um, the leaner animals, the leaner cuts of the animal, the fillet, uh, that kind of thing, where the psoas muscle, for example, is a muscle where there's very little fat, the fat is on the outside. So when you're eating that, that way, uh, even if it's beef, that's the, you know, don't go for the marbled beef, go right. for the cuts that are more pure protein, your fillets, that kind of thing. Um, eggs, uh, instead of adding three yolks to the egg, maybe add three whites to the, uh, uh, to the yolk. Um, so you're bumping up your protein category, your protein consumption in that way. Have you personally tried that though? Because I've tried a leaner, like a few leaner days of, um, just proteins and I feel much more hungrier. Oh, you get ravenous. You absolutely. And Sean says the same thing. You get ravenously hungry. So the point (laughs) is, it's not that you eliminate fat, you cut back on the excess fat. Okay. If you're at a 70, 30, and we've got to talk grams of calories, yeah, yeah, yeah. but if you're at, a, if you're at a, a 70, 30 protein to fat, you can cut that back down to maybe a 50, 50 or a 60, 40. And that works pretty well. Okay. Um, yeah. I think 60, maybe I, I have a hard time seeing 
my clients work on the 50, 50, because I think that's where they'll feel ravenous all the time. And they're wanting to eat all the time. And that's, that's when you let them eat to it. That's why we introduce the two or three meals a day instead of just one meal a day. Right. But my clients eat in ge- because in general, I recommend two to three meals. So when yeah. they eat the two meals and maybe they're eating 50, 50, it's interesting. So my clients that eat like the 70, 30, 80, 20, oh, it's not really 80, 20, but in general, 75% fat, 25% protein. And then I ask them maybe if they're kind of gaining weight. So, okay, let's do two days of leaner proteins, not really any added fats. They'd rather fast then do that because it feels miserable for them to just eat constant protein and they feel raven, you know, like their body is like thermogenically working up in the body. But you know, what's interesting is that flies against what Andrea says, what Ted Naiman says. I know, I know that. So I I think that part of that is also adjustment. If you Mm -hmm. suddenly change your diet on one day, the next day, you're going to feel awful. No matter what you've done, it's because we tend to be rabbits in this world, in the authoritarian carnival world, we tend to be rabbits, not tortoises. Mm. And if you take your time and modify that eating pattern over the course of maybe a month, maybe you adapt to it a little bit differently. But there's no question when you're eating leaner protein as your body adjusts. Because remember, not only is it your gut adjusting to this, your whole biology has to adjust to where its fuel's coming from. So if your cells are saying, hey, I need fat, I need ketones, I need uh, uh, non-esterified fatty acids, and you're giving them sugar, that's problematic. Because anytime, and here's the key thing, anytime you eat protein, lean protein, your insulin goes up. And insulin blocks fat mobilization. So even just a tiny shift in insulin bumps up by one point. So you go from 2.4 to 3.4, non-noticeable but that's blocking fat mobilization. So now you're hungry because between meals, you don't have an energy substrate. So all of those factors have to come in. And I think if you're going to make any changes, make it subtly and slowly, slowly transition. You know, don't just leap into this. The same thing with newbies in keto or carnivore, they leap in, they go from, you know, eating a pizza, tub of ice cream and a gallon of Coke to eating, you know, uh, a cow. One meal a day. And they feel awful. Yeah. One meal a day. And they feel terrible and they crash and they burn. So I think doing it stepwise and easing your way in is the right way to go because there is evidence to the contrary in people who I trust and people who are Zoe Harkham, Ted Naiman, uh, Andreas Infeld. These are icons that I look up to um, who've all reported the same thing. Um, Zoe actually did a whole, I don't know if you know who Zoe Harkham is. Mm -mm. Um, Oh, you need to to connect with her. Uh, Zoe Harkham is a dietitian in the UK. Um, she is basically a statistician dietitian and uh, she's one of the three women that defended Tim Noakes at his trial. Oh, okay. 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 Uh, Zoe Harkin, we wrote a book together called Unpacking Diabetes. So she's been in this arena forever and she does something and I would urge your listeners to do this, urge you to do this. She does something called the Monday newsletter. Uh, in fact, I've got a copy of it here. Um, and every, every Monday, she takes a particularly pertinent topic and she breaks it down statistically. So one of the things that she's talking about here is specifically, uh, this, this is what she's talking about. Should low carb be high fat or high protein? And then she goes to the literature and breaks down some of those studies. Uh, all you have to do is Google her, H-A-R-C-O-M-B-E. You sign up for a Monday newsletter. I'm fascinated by what she produces. And a lot of my talks come from what she and I talk about or she and I share. So she's absolutely phenomenal in terms of what she breaks down. And she speaks from a very pragmatic perspective, not a biased perspective. And as I said, this one, which came out, I think it was, this is April, which is where um, she highlighted the fact that, well, you know what, maybe we're overeating fat. So along those lines, I think that a lot of carnivores overeat salt. Overeat salt? See, that's interesting. So I don't know how much you believe in the hair mineral test. Um, I do a lot of them. And I see that uh, there's a lot of carnivores that are burning through their salt. And then that then will also cause them to have very a deficiency in potassium. And then their calcium and magnesium start um, leaking out, I guess, um, through their cells, not in their blood work yet. 
And so sometimes the thought is that with that, that's why their vitamin D is low. It's a protective mechanism, right? So if they're leaching out some of the calcium from their bones, um, you don't want bone spurs everywhere. And so the vitamin D is in, um, intentionally low. A couple of things about sodium regulation. The human body entirely depends on sodium and chloride right. for, high, for blood fluid and blood pressure management. Yeah. So a large part of the human biology is geared toward complete normal natremia. Okay. You, the, blood, the, the blood sodium and most of the salt is in the bloodstream varies very, very little. We test right. this all the time and it doesn't vary by more than two or three points off 140. So it's very tightly regulated. Right. Sometimes you'll see it a little lower. So, but the entire system of the human body is designed to regulate sodium, whereas blood sugars fluctuate like crazy and sugar is the other molecule that governs blood body fluid. Sodium also is tightly preserved in the kidney. And what most people don't understand is that sodium is primarily preserved in the colon. So the colon can either secrete or absorb. Your largest trans, uh, uh, transport of sodium happens in the, in the colon. Okay. So both in terms of net absorption and net secretion, the kidneys are second and the sweat is third and hydration is not about water. Hydration is about salt, right? If you're at a sodium deficit, you will exchange magnesium, potassium, and calcium. The other protons, the kidneys will preserve salt and pee those others out. Yes. But I test magnesium in everybody. And I've never seen low magnesium. I mean, I say never, it is as rare as rocking horse manure for me to see low magnesiums or affected magnesium or even potassium. They're always very consistent when we measure the blood numbers. Right. So, so I, and I agree with that. Most electrolytes or minerals are balanced in the blood because if you think about blood, it's kind of a transport system. So the body wants it to always be super balanced until it can't, right? So if you start seeing imbalances with potassium and magnesium in your blood, that's when things are pretty serious. Whereas the hair tissue analysis is kind of what's going on in your cells within a snapshot of time. Just like, let's say like the A1C is a snapshot of your red blood cells instead of just that momentary glucose. So the thought is that getting your minerals through a blood blood work is just a snapshot that your body does everything, right? So like your calcium will always show balance in your blood and without knowing it, you may have osteoporosis or osteopenia. Right, but everyone's focused on, on vitamin D for calcium. It's actually controlled by parathyroid hormone, right. TH. And, and so the control of calcium, your, your bones are basically a bank for calcium. Right. Up to the age of about 20, 25 to 28, you're adding to those bones. Okay. After, after about 28 years of age, male and female, you stop growing your bones. There's bone turnover. And yeah. until women get menopausal or until men get into their 50s and 60s, that is static. And then after that, you make withdrawals from that bank. And right. the rate at which you make the withdrawals or not is governed by PTH, vitamin D and calcium consumption. Yeah. But you cannot grow your bones after the age of 28, you okay. cannot additionally deposit. And that whole thing of extrophic calcification, calcium, that is as rare as rocking horse manure. We've seen it, you get dystrophic calcification. Uh, we see that bone formation, but it's usually a biologic abnormality. It doesn't happen in normal. You also got to remember that 96% of your potassium is intracellular right. and only 4% is intravascular, whereas 95 to 98% of your sodium is intravascular. Okay. Very little is in the, most of it's in the membrane of cells because sodium is a, is a transport molecule. Okay. And then the final piece uh, to look at is that a large governor of sodium potassium balance is pH. Yeah. Blood pH. Right. And if you look at, I mean, this is an old, old book from my medical school days. Mm -hmm. And it says it's the acid truth and basic facts with a sweet touch and enlightenment, L-Y-T-E. And this is the holy grail of uh, electrolyte balance based on pH, based on, uh, and all of those things are affected. So to look at one molecule and supplement with that one molecule is crazy. It's the entirety of everything. And if you look at, and I'm just bringing this up as a, as a concept, I consume a ton of salt, but I'm not sure that's entirely appropriate. First of all, meat in general has a lot of sodium in it. It has a lot of all the electrolytes in it. It's not that they're electrolyte poor. And I'm not saying don't supplement, but if you, if you know a guy called the bear, um, yeah. I can't remember what he's, but Oslo he's been, something. Yeah, he's been eight years no salt. 
So again, there you've got an experiment. I'm not certain I agree with that completely. Right. This is a debate I'm having with uh, Doug Reynolds and a couple of other guys where um, people are now starting to say, okay, carnivores say, hey, let's back off on the salt. And I have concerns about backing off, but I do think we've gone overboard with magnesium supplementation and sodium supplementation and ca- all these, everyone's on calcitrol and they're on mag glycinate or now they're on mag citrate, which is basically a laxative. It doesn't right. get absorbed. So I'm just throwing out the caution that we, the beauty about being carnivore is we don't need much more than what we eat. And I agree with that for the most part. So, you know, as you heal, then you don't need supplements. There's oh. no question that we're not talking about early on. We're talking about the carnivore veterans. Yes. Oh, oh, early, oh, on, early on, you want to correct the mistakes. Right, right. So the, the salt. Um, so th- the thing about salt is I think there were numbers done where maybe you have to eat two pounds to get in order to get enough of the sodium that you would need in your daily. And I don't know well, the exact numbers. But, but so wait can... a minute. You see, this is, again, the same issue. Okay. Is I understand that we've worked out sodium requirements sure. based on standard American diet. Okay, okay fair but enough. But when you're a carnivore, do you really, if you don't need much in the way of B12 to get a B12 up to 2000, <laughs> is the same not true for your body's improved utilization sure. of electrolytes? Because the body is highly conservationistic yes. when it comes to processes. Now, the, the beauty about the human body is that when it functions normally, those processes are incredibly tight. But when you have excess, the body has this huge capacity, what we call futile cycles. Mm -hmm. And for example, protein, the negative nitrogen balance is a futile cycle where it's spinning between fat and protein. Well, the same thing is true when you're in a very, very tight hormonal, I hate the word balance, but when you're in that vibrational state, your fluxes of electrolytes just aren't there. That's where in in that high carnivore thing, when you overdo even electrolytes, you may be throwing that out of, out of whack. And I, and I get that in the way that you're explaining it, but in what I'm seeing in my practice is that if we understand that our soils are depleted, so even our cows that are eating the grass, there's less minerals, right? In the Carnivore Cure book, I showed mineral changes in just 20 years in a lot of our fruits and vegetables. It's a lot lower for sure. all minerals. That was one thought is maybe a lot of us are deficient in minerals. And the only reason I looked into this is because most people on a carnivore diet, I would say, struggle with the electrolyte imbalance. They say, I've added, so the, the kind of solution or the band-aid that people do in the end is, I've, I decided to add back more, a few more fruits and plants because I cannot get my electrolyte well in the middle of the night. I have well, like They're making an assumption. They're calling something electrolytes when they have no <laughs> proof. There's, no, there's zero evidence that these people have that electrolyte imbalance. So, oh, I've got muscle cramps. It must be potassium. It's muscle cramps. It must be magnesium. Because somebody on the internet yesterday said that's what the problem was. So they're investing in these massive amounts of things that they're taking with an assumption that my leg cramps, and then magically in a placebo way, the leg cramps get better. So, oh, it must be that. Or, oh, I've got to eat fruit. And you've got all these voices on the internet talking about stuff. I add salt fairly liberally. I love Redmond Real Salt. Um, it is what I enjoy. I actually add a little bit of iodized salt. But I think as I'm looking at myself, I'm, I'm rethinking that, you know what, I did pretty well to my current age without eating a lot of salt. Okay. And, and now I'm adding these massive amounts. Yes, my body can get rid of that huge amounts, but I'm not sure that electrolytes are, again, purely the answer. I think we need way lower numbers of electrolytes because I just have no evidence to support what people are saying about electrolyte deficiencies. And I don't have biologic evidence. I don't have, and it's, you're right, it's not just what's in the blood, but what's in the blood reflects every other space in the human body. And if you look at the pH, if you look at the bicarb, Mm -hmm. Uh, which we measure on everybody, the CO2, if anybody's looking at HCO2 or CO2, that reflects your acid-base status. Sure. And those are are highly, highly conserved in human beings. And they govern the flux of electrolytes. Nobody is electrolyte deficient. It depends on the electrolyte uh, level in each cavity, in each space. Nobody's globally... Uh, sodium deficient because they'd be dead. Right. Okay. So, I mean, when you, for, okay, so when there are electrolyte imbalances, you know, when people are really low in potassium, they're, they're on an IV and most of that sodium. So 
The but question, let, me, let me just stop you there, because I deal with, when people okay. puke a lot, and as a bariatric surgeon, when you right. patients who puke a lot, well, you're puking out hydrochlo uh, hydrochloric acid, you're puking sure. out acid, and your, your blood then turns alkaline and your, your potassium levels drop. So the point is, that is not a lack of potassium. This is the whole point I'm making. That's a shift of potassium out of the blood space into the uh, um, cellular space. And the right thing there to do is to correct the acid base balance. Yes, we add potassium because cardiovascular is so important, but it's a temporary fix. Sure. We add it as a bolus to keep that patient alive. But our pools are the, the whole body pool of sodium, potassium, calcium, all of those things is massive. Even if you've got osteopenia or osteoporosis, mm -hmm. you still have an extraordinary amount of calcium to keep your calcium levels low. Calcium levels go abnormal when your parathyroid is out of whack, when your vitamin Ds are, when your uh, osteoclasts are not working well. It is not about the consumption of the mineral. It's about oh, yeah. the release and the balance within the spaces. Yes, we have to add to that pool slowly. But the question is the magnitude. By which, I mean, if you look at the amount of salt that people are consuming, it's through the roof. And part of the concern there is it probably isn't biologically necessary, but it makes us a target for everybody else that believes salt is so bad for us. Well, does that make sense? Yeah, it does. But maybe it's also this our stress levels, right? So cortisol or the adrenals, right? They love... Uh, aldosterone loves sodium. So maybe yeah. it's oh, the, the entirety of the renin angiotensin one angiotensin two, right. that entire system exists in the human body to govern one thing, sodium. Right. Okay. It's, it's all about salt, all the blood pressure medications that we, that we put patients on almost right. all of them mess with the sodium renin angiotensin right. thing. The ACE inhibitors, the, they all mess with that, the, the uh, um, angiotensin inhibitors, they all mess with that sodium potassium, uh, or the sodium chloride system. So it is fundamental to being human. And the point is, when you are at a salt deficiency, a true biological salt deficiency, you're dead. Right, right. There's something that we used to see in our, in our liver transplant patients where their sodium level would go down into the 127, 128 range, which is only 10 or 12 points below where it should, or 20 points below where it should be. Their brains are infarcting. They're getting sent something called central pontine myelinolysis, where their brains just die. The, wow. the middle of the brain just dies. And that is a minor shift down of sodium. So, and that's again, the liver function that happened in, in the liver transplant, some liver transplant patients. And the concern with that is that, as I said, we, I think we way overemphasize the consumption of salt. Having salt in your food, absolutely. Do lions in Africa go to the salt licks and drink breath? Absolutely they do. But not, they don't sit there and shake salt on every antelope that they kill. And that's the key thing. And the more metabolically healthy you are, the less you need massive input of stuff. Okay, that, that I fully agree with. Maybe it's just the people that I'm seeing have the electrolyte imbalances are people that are still in the newbie phase and not in the veteran. There, there, there's just a handful of influencers, I'd say, in the social media space where they said, I could never balance my electrolytes and therefore I added fruit, right? Because then you start retaining more sure. water. Um, but I, I just think it's a Band-Aid. Um, why would you say then that some people are labeling that they have electrolyte imbalance because they're getting leg cramps in the middle of the night? So, but the point there is it's not, and this is the, this is the distinction I'm making. It may be an electrolyte imbalance, but it's not a, an electrolyte deficit. It means oh, okay. that that's the, that's the point I'm trying to make is your body. If I took your whole body and I melted it down, and I extracted all the electrolytes, they would be exactly what you need. Right. You know, I, the, the simple argument is this, and this is the whole egg argument. How much cholesterol is there in an egg? How much potassium is there in an egg? How much fat is there in an egg? How much protein? Exactly, exactly the right amount to make a chicken. <laughs> uh, you know, and it doesn't matter if that egg comes from some broiler chicken that's, that's sure. in a cage that's being fed stuff, or it comes from some free-range, beautiful, healthy chicken. Sure, sure. All of those eggs, when fertilized, become a chicken. So it's not like they're running at a massive sodium deficit. They've got everything in there and they've got the capacity to make a chicken out of that diversity. So it is not a substrate deficiency. It is an imbalance within the muscle system. 
because it's shifted out to whatever it is. Your lactic acid may be a little high, but people are assuming that they're low in electrolytes and that's where the BS is. Most people are not. They may not be in the compartment where they should be, but it's not that they have a deficiency. And, and that is, everybody runs to, I've got to put more in my face. The, the same thing when somebody says, oh, I'm hungry. Hunger in the modern era has nothing to do with biology. You're not hungry because your selenium levels are low. But what, what do people say? I'm hungry, I've got to eat. Or I'm feeling weak, I need calories. So with my bariatric patients, these are enormous people mm -hmm. that I do surgery on. And for the few weeks after the surgery, they don't consume calories because the surgery is healing. Right. Oh, I'm hungry. I have to eat my nutrition. It's got, you're walking around, you're 300 pounds. You are not at a calorie deficit. That, that is just a shift away from glucose to burning fat. But the perception by everybody is I have to consume more. And the bizarre thing about hunger, if you do a fast, if you do a 72 hour fast, I assume you've done them at yeah. two and three days. Are you hungry? No, your hunger goes away. Right. So it cannot be a biological nutritional deficiency. It's a mental state. Because if it was a biologic nutritional deficiency, your hunger would increase and increase and increase. And in fact, it goes away. Right. And that's part of the problem with carnivores is they, they're not hungry, especially with a high fat. So we've got to make a distinction between levels within our body and compartment shifts versus absolute deficiency. And most people are not absolutely electrolyte deficient. Most people are compartmentally challenged. Sure. Okay. And that's, that's the, that's the challenge. That, that's just really what I'm, what I'm trying to say. So we over put that in. And because we, we assume that I've got a leg cramp, I'm deficient in magnesium, I must eat it. Whereas you may be deficient in magnesium in your muscles, but you've got tons of it in your liver or elsewhere in your body. And it's just getting it to your muscles that's the problem. Right. Um, yeah. And I, there are actually a lot of studies that show that magnesium when taken orally takes nine months to even move the needle just a little bit. So, I mean, that's where I just have my clients sometimes use a little bit of magnesium spray and put it on their leg at night, just because it's topical. I know it's a band aid, like you're um, saying, but, but it helps them in um, those moments. Um, what I'm hearing from you is that, you know, when you are first starting carnivore, this isn't really the discussion for you, but that's when, if you need to do high fat, just get off the insulin roller coaster, balance hormones, do all of that. But once you are kind of in the, I've done this for a year plus and, you know, insulin is low, all of the mar markers you mentioned, like triglycerides are low, your C peptide, et cetera. Um, but then if you just, you, if you start checking your markers and your like triglycerides are going up, blood sugar, A1C, et cetera, then maybe you want to shift from just a high fat to maybe consuming a little bit more protein or at least dropping a little bit of the ex, um, extra added fats, and then maybe even try multiple meals. First of all, you said it's not for, for people just starting carnivore. Absolutely. They may not be doing this, but absolutely it's incentive to be strict about your carnivore because really what we're talking about is that on a carnivore diet over time, your body becomes supremely efficient. Right. And yeah. what, what we fail to do is to recognize the efficiency so we are still throwing things into the body as if it is behaving in an inefficient way. Mm -hmm. And that may be a concern. So the first part of carnivore is to restore normal health. And then the second part is to understand that we've got this vibrational efficiency and we don't have to add a lot to that. You know, you've got those um, machines where uh, you, you have the ball on one side and it it goes tick tock, tick tock, right, you know, right. across, and, and it just never stops, stops work. That's kind of how the body works. And it needs very, very little to be added to the system to maintain that, uh, um, that normality. One of the very interesting things, and Gary Taubes um, uh, and a group of us have been talking about this. If you look back at historically at the hunter gatherer and early people, there was no cancer. Yeah. Cancer right. did not exist. There was no evidence in those early missionaries that went to Africa, that went to South, they didn't see cancer. And a large part of the restoration of that incredibly efficient system is that the, the human body becomes supremely efficient at correcting little mistakes. Mm. The problem with cancer is these massive mistakes uncorrected happen. And it's the same whether you're talking about electrolytes or protein or everything else is 
The problems happen when you're unhealthy, when you're out of balance, as you say, and you get these massive shifts. When you are a veteran carnivore, those shifts don't happen. They're vibrations. And the human body is self-correcting. That's the beauty about it. And I think if we overeat, overconsume a certain thing, you actually shift that efficiency out of whack. And that's a concern that I have. So that eight-year veteran is not eating salt. It's because he doesn't need very much. Mm. But early on, you may need some. So you're right. This is really a conversation for the veterans, but it should be incentive and inspiration for people to want to get there. Because this is the holy grail of human of, of human biology. And I and I have to agree with you. I mean, so I use supplements in the very beginning because I was plant based for twelve years. I've been carnivore for over three years. Sometimes I'll have a few plants just to be non dogmatic. But I've noticed some changes. Exercise in the morning, I used to feel very low energy, and now I can exercise, and it's not a big deal. So my energy is very consistent. Whereas in the first year or so. I felt low energy and I felt like, oh, it's my electrolytes, right? And, and I don't feel that. But I think I can, just- Can I just, you just said yeah. something here. I think it's, this is another very valid thing is that fatigue lasts a very long time when you convert. So don't go carnival for two days and expect your fatigue to vanish. <laughs> it's going to take months to years to right. get into that efficiency state, but you've got the rest of your life to live. Right. So if you take, if you take your current age and age 100, that's how long you want to live for. And- fatigue going away in a couple of days. Oh, these, and we then ascribe that, that poor energy level. Oh, it's this, it's this. No, it, the body doesn't work that way. It's a very slow pathway to efficiency. And that's why the sustainability of this way of life, even three years is a very short period of time. It is. Uh, you know, I started my journey 22 years ago. Have I had relapses? Have I had bounces and bumps from that? Of course I have. Am I perfect? Hell no, I'm not. But I've seen evolution every year of getting healthier and better through that. Um, And that's the beauty about this ride is that it gets better and better and better. And it's the sustainability, but don't expect magic to happen in a day. In the carnivore space, a lot of the women, um, especially when they start in their 50s and 60s, say that they have Hashimoto's or hypothyroid. So they always ask me and I tell them, you know, we may have a new normal. My TSH is um, low. My T4 is low, but my T3 is also below range actually, but I'm nursing my son who's five and I get my menstruation every month. So I think I'm pretty good, but it's not enough. Right. So people are like, well, all these other thyroid specialists say that I need to get on medication because my T3 is out of range and you should feel a lot of fatigue. Well, they're looking at one number, right? You have to look at the human body. It works like a very fine tuned Swiss watch. Mm -hmm. Every cog integrates with every cog. And you can't look at one thing and say, oh, that's out of whack. Every, let's treat that. More and more doctors do blood work to find an abnormal number to throw a pill at it. And they ignore numbers where they don't have a pill for it. Right. So that's why I use the type 1 example. Most of these patients would be categorized by type, as type 1 diabetics by the endocrinologist who look at one number. But the A1Cs are below five, their blood sugars are normal. So you can't say that. You've got to look at the integration. T3 by itself is usually low in a veteran carnivore, but so is their TSH, so is their T4, and it's not an iodine deficiency. So you can't look at one thing um, and say, oh, this is deficient. Whether it's electrolytes, whether it's protein, whether it's fat, whatever it is, you've got to look at the entire spectrum of what we do. And we've forgotten how to do that as healthcare workers. I, I'm certainly not better than anybody. And, and the first thing I'll declare to patients is that, or to people that come and see me is, I know certain things, I don't know certain things. I'm seeing certain things that I can't explain. Mm-hmm. Let's be part of this kind of experiment and let's work right. it out. That's the first thing. Um, the second thing is, I'll tell them this, when there's a particular political fact and you put on, let's say Fox News, Sean Hannity is going to have a particular perspective of that fact. Then you put on MSNBC and Rachel Maddow is going to have the polar opposite opinion of the same fact. And they'll never be on the same page. That is what has happened in healthcare because it's more opinion based than biology or factually based. I'm going to have an opinion based on what I see in my experience. Your other doctors are going to have this uh, polar opposite opinion. However, when it comes to watching TV, you are the one with the control button. And exactly the same is true with healthcare. 
you look, and, and it's important to go and get my opinion and get the statin-pushing doctor's opinion. And ask them probing questions. Ask me whatever probing questions you want to. And then you decide who you're going to follow. But one thing, one thing is absolutely certain, Jenny. There's only one thing that's true. And that is we're all going to die. Right. Okay. So how we get there is our chosen pathway. We can choose how we get there. And you then have to live and die by your choice. Not because some doctor gave you misinformation, but it's because you chose to believe that doctor's misinformation. We physicians are so afraid that if I don't put you on a statin, you have a heart attack, then it's my fault. Right. But if you have a heart attack on a statin, oh dear. It doesn't work that way. You make the choices based on the best available information and we're all learning as we go. So if you want to come along for the ride, hit your wagon to us. And we'll be as open and as transparent as we can be yes. about our knowledge and our lack of knowledge and how our knowledge changes. That's why I bring up the low salt thing. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But it's a, it is absolutely correct to question it and then to do the experiment so that we can find the truth. If you are, you must eat salt or no, you shouldn't eat salt, we're screwed because you're never going to come to the truth. I think we're on the same page in so many things of, there's a lot we don't know, and um, but you see trends, and that's exactly what I was seeing, and that's exactly why I wanted you on, because these are such nuances that people say, carnivore is so simple, you're complicating it, and it's actually not as simple, especially if you're doing it long-term or if you had certain metabolic disease or other things. So I think this is really good, especially for people that have been doing carnivore for a while. So thank you so much for this conversation. Any, on any long journey, the landscape changes. It's totally. never the same. On a carnivore journey, the landscape changes, your biology changes. Yeah. Don't expect the same landscape throughout the journey. Accommodate to the new, to the new landscape as you progress. It gets better. So that's the, that's the, this is a journey. It's not a place to be. It's let me, a continuum. Let yeah. me ask you one last question. Um, do you think that people can do, because there's a lot of people that don't believe this. That's what I'm asking. Um, do you believe that you can do carnivore forever? You know what? Lions have to become vegetarians as they grow older. Absolutely. Okay. No, they don't. <laughs> I was like, what? No, of course okay. you can. I mean, no, that was me being facetious. Um, you know, when a lion gets six years old, it says, no, I've got to go and eat plants. No, of course you can. And the human biology is geared toward doing this, but you've got to understand what you're doing. So can you do carnivore for the rest of your life? Absolutely. But should it be the same carnivore? Yeah. Absolutely not. Okay. You've got yeah. to look at the feedback. And that's why I say the landscape's changing. Your body becomes better. It becomes more efficient. And as it evolves, you've got to evolve your diet with that landscape. That's the key. And you've got to know who you are. And that's, if anything, if you ask me who I am, what we do, if anything, I'm not there for, I'm there to tell people how to start. And then I'm there to give people guidance or insight along the journey that they are better at following than I am knowing. So my job is to empower people to know and understand what they're doing better than I do, because it's your body, it's your, it's your life. And I can give you guidelines, just like we talked about now, and you're going to think about it. I'm going to think about certain things. That's why I love these talks. So that's what we do. The first thing is do no harm. The second thing is stop making people unhealthy and give them the tools to make themselves as healthy as they can be should they choose that pathway. That's what we do. And we've got a bunch of tools and a bunch of experience and a bunch of direction that we can do that on. Well, thank so, you. You know, you can find me on my YouTube channel. It's Carb Addiction Doc. I'm also on Instagram. I have a presence on Facebook, but I'm just too busy to spend time on Facebook. I am an addict. I'm a carb addict, which we didn't even talk about. So when it comes to Facebook, I just can't get off it. Just like this talk, it was supposed to be a short thing. We just carried on and on, but it's for the love of what we do. So uh, uh, those are places that you can find me. If somebody wants a consult, uh, Eric code 561-517-0642, they can text that number or call and leave a message. But do understand, please be patient. Uh, we are just overwhelmed with folks right now. I'm looking actually to add nurse practitioners, dietitians, certified diabetic educators to our team. It's myself and Jane, our dietitian at the moment, but we're looking to add experienced workers in this field who want to join our team. So that's a plug for growth. If you're interested in joining us, please give me a shout. 
And I'll put every, all the information in the show notes. So thank you again so much for this. Um, and I will, um, yeah, I'll talk to you soon. And I'm sure we'll, it'll be interesting to see how Carnivore grows over the years. Great. It's, it really has been a great journey so far and there's more to come. Thanks very much. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs>